there is a, a year to year 70% growth rate on how to videos, the how to search category on YouTube. Um, the, there's absolutely massive economic and educational value there that's mostly not commented upon in like wider media discussions of uh, say video or social media and so on. But if you think about it, there are these four basic factors that have completely transformed the economics of knowledge transfer. The first one is high definition cameras. High definition cameras can capture all the nuanced and uh, small fine motions that say might make a difference between a great dancer and a mediocre dancer, mm -hmm. or an amazing chef and an okay chef, or ultimately, a exceptional heart surgeon and a mediocre heart surgeon, right? The same principles apply to some very important high-tech fields that apply in these seemingly mundane activities. What they all have in common is that they rely heavily on tacit knowledge, unspoken knowledge, uh, stuff that rests in the particular way you say, uh, twist a component or uh, use a machine, stuff that's very difficult to put into a, you know, a written user manual, as I'm sure anyone that's ever tried to assemble an IKEA table can, can tell. Uh, that's the first factor. The second factor is uh, broadband. Uh, we have the broadband to just watch this video on demand. The third factor is search engines and recommendation engines, which are the most important application of search engines. The most watched videos on YouTube are the watch next videos. Hmm. So whatever YouTube serves you, this is the likeliest thing that you'll watch next. The same applies to say your Twitter feed or your Facebook feed and so on. Ultimately, the same technology also rests in the recommended purchases on Amazon. These choices where we are presented with an option before we guess what we want next or the explicit search queries allow us to find the needle in the haystack. Mm -hmm. If I want to learn how to repair my car, I don't really, you know, I don't want this to be a five or six hour research expedition. I want to put the search term, how to fix my car, or if I'm a little smarter, how to fix my car, and then the model of my car. Mm -hmm. And there's very likely at this point to be a YouTube video uh, showing you how to do many things, maybe even diagnose what's ultimately wrong with the car, right? Yeah, so I've, moved a couple months ago and I didn't keep any of the manuals mm -hmm. that I moved with because now we've gotten to a point where I don't need manuals that come with whatever product I buy. I can just go on YouTube and look at exactly how to set something up. I was trying to, so I had to set up an HP printer. My goodness. Printers are horribly designed. We just, I don't know how old printers are. We still haven't figured out how to make them easy to set up. And I couldn't read the manual. It just didn't work for me, so I went on YouTube, typed in the exact make, model, and number of this HP printer, and I set it up. The other thing that was brought to mind as you were speaking there is there's a player on the Boston Celtics. His name is Jason Tatum, mm -hmm. and there was an article in the Wall Street Journal like two years ago about Jason Tatum's footwork, and he's 21 years old very young, mm -hmm. but coaches who watch him and scouts say that he plays like he's been in the league for two decades. And the direct quote is something like, he plays like he's been surrounded by the NBA for 20 years. And it's because he has. What he did was he would watch slow motion videos of Kobe Bryant's footwork <laughs> and has now been able to mirror that. And so even though he's 20, there's elements of his game which have been clearly influenced by this tacit knowledge on YouTube that you're describing. Yes. Um, like the fourth very interesting category here is also the advent of portable screens. Hmm. So we mostly now watch uh, we mostly now watch YouTube videos on our phones. This means you can easily bring it to your workshop or to a game, mm -hmm. right? Much more easily, say, than an HD television or the old computer screens that people used to use that we still probably mostly now use for coding and watching movies. Yeah. Um, these four factors could have come together in any platform, right? That could have been something that's not YouTube, but it's YouTube. The entertaining, the same platform that enables us to find entertaining videos also allows us to upload and share our own educational videos. Mm -hmm. This knowledge is so heavily diffused across society that it makes no sense whatsoever to send a professional documentary team to like to make expensive BBC style documentaries about the details of how to fix a specific car mm -hmm. or about the details of the legwork mm -hmm. in uh, you say 
uh, in sports like say the NBA, NFL, whatever, yeah. right? Like the details there don't make sense, but it does make sense for a practitioner to pick up their phone or if they're a little bit more ambitious, you know, set up a YouTube camera with higher quality and upload it, mm -hmm. right? If only to share with their friends. And the communities of practitioners that are forming on YouTube add a significant social component to this, where the old wisdom of the internet five or 10 years ago was don't read the comment section. Right. Now, I think reading the comment section on some of these high quality videos provides insightful commentary mm -hmm. because people have started to follow their entire communities there of uh, people practicing woodworking, uh, mm -hmm. citing each other's videos, people who have watched hundreds of hours of woodworking tutorials, they sometimes have things to say or are themselves practitioners who found it randomly. Two questions for you. The first one is, now that new kinds of knowledge transfer can be made, how does that impact the kind of knowledge that can be respected in society? If I look at the academy, if I go to Harvard, mm -hmm. it is almost by definition the parts of knowledge, philosophy, physics, mathematics, history. The knowledge that's accepted there and is held in high esteem is knowledge that's easily transferred through text. And now yes. we're going to see an explosion of knowledge that's able to be transferred through video. That almost seems like there's going to be a clash of older people who might say, oh, this kind of knowledge isn't something that we respect. Whereas younger people are going to say, what are you talking about? This is just a kind of knowledge that's extremely important. It just so happens that these institutions haven't been built around these kinds of knowledge in say the last 50 years. Yeah, having a notable following online, a following that would attract enough attention to warrant criticism mm -hmm. is perhaps a really, a real form of peer review, mm -hmm. right? Like in a way, yeah. if you are a practitioner and you're making wooden tables and your channel has 100,000 subscribers, well, you know, you can't be bluffing someone in the 100,000 subscribers would point out that you're being fraudulent yes. or the thing can't possibly be made yes. or that you've edited out important steps. The communities of practitioners acquire, ultimately, a community of public critique. Hmm. And this is what makes these sort of online followings more and more a credential in their own right. So when you see a poll that say says that you know something like 60 or 70 percent of people under 20 want to be YouTube stars, Mm -hmm. Maybe they're just correctly tracking the future of reputation. Right. Perhaps being a YouTube star is better for you in the long run than, say, a Harvard degree might be. Hmm. Right? There might be um, a big transformation under, underway here. I mean, you're talking to somebody who has a writing school, and I fundamentally believe that that kind of reputation is still massively undervalued. You know, one idea that I always go back to is people always say, we're in the attention economy now. What does mm. that mean? What is the proof of that? To me, the proof of it is that if you look at the top five wealthiest companies in the world, Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, and Amazon, all five of them have meaningful multi-billion dollar advertising divisions. Correct. And they track your uh, behavior, your online behavior, much more closely than marketers in the 1950s, 60s, mm -hmm. or 70s could have ever dreamed of. Um, this you know, produces better market product fits. It also, however, allows them to uh, train their users, right? Like one of the most important things about new products is that users often don't know how, what to make of a new device. When Steve Jobs introduces the iPhone originally, he talks about it as three devices in one. Mm. Today, it wouldn't even occur to us to describe you know, a smartphone that way. It's just a smartphone. Mm -hmm. But before the concept exists, you kind of have to train people through analogies or through perhaps you know, the online user interface you present them with. Mm -hmm. Um, the attention economy as such produces interesting incentives here, though. Arguably, the strongest thing you can have is a platform. As an individual, you're almost never going to have a real platform. What you can have is some cross-platform name recognition mm -hmm. and bounce and build reputation between several different, uh, several different environments. I think people haven't quite realized that algorithm arbitrage is a viable approach to growing your audience significantly. Mm -hmm. The exact same content on Instagram, Twitter, or a YouTube comment or post will be treated completely re differently mm -hmm. by the different recommendation engines because of the different incentives of these platforms. 
but ultimately if you bundle it all together under say a name like perhaps you have or perhaps many other like new generation entrepreneurs have uh, that works quite well you can quickly move your audience to new platforms mm -hmm. Absolutely. When back to this knowledge idea, because I think it's really interesting. Whenever I'm abroad, I'm always amazed at how much of the knowledge is new knowledge is being consumed just on YouTube. Yes. And what happens for a society that, say, 30 years ago didn't have a lot of access to books and other forms of media mm. and now has access to YouTube and other video? What does a society look like if it's video first? I think a video first society will in some ways be a richer society than a book first wow. society. Uh, my argument for this would be a lot of the skills are extremely practical. Arguably everyone in the United States now, you know, if we had to take an average guess, I would say that somewhere on the range of a few hundred or a few thousand dollars in repairs are in a sense saved every year by the typical US citizen because something like 50 to 100 million people have watched how-to tutorials for repair, construction, and mm -hmm. so on on YouTube. Uh, this is stuff that doesn't show up in GDP numbers. Say, if I hire you for $10,000 to fix my car, mm -hmm. GDP has risen. If I watch a video and I don't click on any ads and then I fix my own car, GDP is the same. Mm -hmm. So in a very practical sense that, um, especially in p places of material deprivation, this has a much bigger effect because ultimately, you know, repairing your physical environment, mastering your physical environment is the first sort of stage of prosperity, mm -hmm. right? Everything from better farming techniques to, you know, this sort of like participating in the consumer economy in a better way. Millennials could not live their life in the West, right? So if we, if we now make the controversial claim that millennials are somewhat deprived compared to boomers, they're certainly more debt laden and they've certainly had uh, you know an unfortunate start to their careers where they entered a recession heavy economy this actually according to most economics research is going to show up in their lifetime earnings mm. so if you're unlucky enough to enter the labor market 2010 2011 2009 uh, you in fact will have lower lifetime incomes mm. because the assumption is going to be no one's going to remember that 2008 recession. They're just going to notice that you've had lower salaries for whatever reason in your past job. Mm -hmm. uh, so we can make many other arguments on, on millennials and so on. So it's not just, I think, these countries that are low in literacy. I think the transformation will be big in societies with literacy. There's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Stuff that we haven't yet figured out can be interfaced via video. Um, I think ultimately, though, that in the rest of the world, video will, in tandem with digital text, because obviously on your smartphone, you can read or listen to a podcast mm -hmm. just as much as you can watch a video. Mm -hmm. The uh, text revolution and the video revolution is happening simultaneously. There will be many talented people who will basically use this to plug into first world economies, right? This is most obvious with code but might eventually come to industries such as graphic design. Mm. I think right now we greatly underestimate the importance of graphic design and so on. The assumption is that only people who are heavily embedded in a cultural context can do this well, uh, but more and more the access exists there to the same cultural context everyone else has. What do you see happening with that access? What I see is two things happening. The first is that the tools are getting so good. Yes. So with graphic design, I, for example, always get compliments on the slides in my Rite of Passage course. That's just because I bought a series of slides for $20 on Creative Market, and then I use those slides yes. to, to create my own. Then you see my friend runs a Instagram stories company, and it's super easy to create really beautiful Instagram stories because you can use drag and drop templates. So that's sort of the first thing that I see happening is that the tools are getting so much better, and we have entire ecosystems of design tools that are extremely easy to use. But then on the other hand, because we're spending so much time scrolling Instagram and looking at images, our image and photo sensibility is skyrocketing and now it's always really funny because if i meet somebody who's say under 20 years old they have a natural ability to frame a photo and to look at what is the right set of proportions and balance and what isn't 
Yeah, basically, you know, the ability to take a good photos is now just one of those basic life skills. Mm -hmm. It's very strange, <laughs> you know, if you told everyone in 1999 that in 20 years time, everyone's going to be a photographer, that would seem quite silly, mm -hmm. right? You might have uh, this understanding that a good photo might make a good headshot on a resume. You might correctly predict that people would like to share uh, memories of family life. But what people would not imagine is that photography would become one of the basic forms of communication. Mm -hmm. So they might have seen the digital camera coming, but they wouldn't have seen the social network mm -hmm. where using, again, the benefits of high broadband technology, we get to share the images very rapidly, very easily. Mm -hmm. And further that, you know, the same device that takes the picture is the device that sends the picture to mm -hmm. this, you know, yes. to this website, basically. Um, those things will continue. And I suspect that the next leap forward is going to be with uh, machine learning assisted video editing technology. Mm -hmm. The most laborious process in making video right now is editing the videos. So if we have something that can edit videos relatively well, or at least make a few things easier, uh, this will probably produce an explosion of video content where a still picture will be over time more and more displaced by a moving picture, mm -hmm. perhaps a TikTok length clip. Yeah, you even see it in, I hope that GIFs make a comeback. And mm -hmm. I think that they they will because there's something about that looping video that's a form of expression that we really saw come up with Tumblr. Yes. And Tumblr had their own financial struggles. And now, hopefully, Tumblr, either Tumblr makes some kind of comeback or something else comes around with the GIF. We've seen it on Twitter. The GIF is doing very well. We've seen it in texting. The GIF is doing really well. But I still think it's an undertapped mechanism for communication. I think that's definitely the case. It partially also, you know, we can have higher definition just than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, where I think that the main problem with the old ones is they, they just look dated. If you look at mm -hmm. something from 2007, it looks terrible. Just as to be fair, photography from 2007 looks terrible. Um, yeah, these modes of expression are very important. They come to mediate more and more of our social lives, where in a very real sense, you know, you build your social capital more and more virtually. And the question is, well, what's more real? Your memories of an event or the social media post you made about an event? Mm -hmm. How long before the social media post you made in 2012 is just more visceral and more real than whatever recollection you might have had? Perhaps we're recreating our own past all the time by showing only the positive picture. Perhaps your day-to-day -day experience isn't that great, but you still smile for the Instagram photo. Mm -hmm. Do you, 10 years later, remember you were actually miserable on that vacation? <laughs> what do you, just sort of switching gears a bit, what do you see happening in, in cities? So I'm going to kind of throw out the narrative, and you can tell me what's right and what's wrong. So the, what seems true to me is that cities are a massive, untapped well for economic growth, in that if we can get cities, we can get people into cities, we can truly transform their lives. There was a study that came out and it basically looked at just New York, San Francisco, and San Jose. And it looked at the, the, the case that these economists made was that if housing restrictions were lifted just in those three cities, the economy in those cities would have gone up by 36.7%. And then the knowledge would diffuse to the rest of society and GDP in America would be up something like 3.6%, which is a crazy claim to make, basically saying that cities are the biggest bottleneck that we have in society. And because we have housing restrictions such as minimum apartment sizes and restrictions that make it very hard to build new homes, we're not getting people into cities, which is slowing growth and progress. What is your take on that? I think that in a very real sense, this has just always been the case of civilized life. One of the reasons, you know, the Roman state could afford the prosperity it did is because it had this massive Mediterranean trade basin, but also because a large proportion of its population was urbanized. At one point, there were over 12 cities in the Roman Empire, each with a population of 1 million people plus. So there, 
it could be that the technical limitations were the biggest problem. You know, how do you get enough water into the cities? How do you get sewage out of a city? Once those technical problems were solved, higher densities were possible, and the outbreak of, say, infectious diseases was minimized. Mm -hmm. Today, our problems are less sanitation and more, like you point out, this sort of housing supply question. Well, it's housing supply, but it's also things like uh, mass transit. It's also things like um, safety. It's also things like livability for families. The ability to raise children in a city seems very important. One of the main reasons people move out of uh, cities later in their life is if they want to start a family. Uh, now, of course, cities are very different in this regard. What is upstream of housing supply? What is upstream of mass transit? I'd argue it's city politics. Mm. So I think that if we want to open up cities, we can't just wish for it or advocate for it. We have to reimagine city politics. Would it perhaps make sense to enfranchise the uh, future residents of a city, allow future residents of a city to simply bid up prices, saying that if and only if a place is constructed here, I will pay this amount of rent for it? or perhaps some way to exert political pressure so that cities are not just beholden to their current residents, but possible future residents. These things could really break the chokehold, the political chokehold that exists downstream of basically what amount to like um, anti-construction interests that exist in, in every city, ultimately. Yeah, when I've looked at this, it seems like the worst offender of powerful families and parties not allowing new construction as Hong Kong. Yes, yes. I mean, well, you know, globally in the United States, you could argue San Francisco is uh, probably wasting something like 50 billion, 100 billion dollars of uh, potential wealth that could have been created, maybe even something as much as half a trillion, depending on how optimistic one is. In Hong Kong also, uh, there is the reality that there is a growing urban zone just outside of Hong Kong. Historically, one of the big advantages of Hong Kong over the Chinese mainland was a better regulatory environment, right? An environment where property rights would be expected, where rule of law was upheld, but also an environment where construction was easy and the best use possible was made out of that very small piece of land. Shenzhen is not that far away from Hong Kong, and more and more the areas around Hong Kong are easier to build. Now. Of course, these are still two different systems, but I bet there are many people in Hong Kong who now, for the first time ever in their life, are considering whether life in a mainland Chinese city might be better for them. What would be an alternative to getting people in cities? It seems that even in cities, that's also downstream of another problem that you mentioned earlier around transportation. And I was looking at a map the other day of what BART Bay Area Rapid Transit could have been, and it would have gone as far north as Napa and Sonoma, it would have gone far east, there would have been a connection right by the, the Dumbarton Bridge, and so the entire Bay Area would have truly been connected in a way that it isn't now, and now, my goodness, if you're commuting from, from the Dublin Pleasanton stop into downtown San Francisco, and then you have to take another train, that's an hour and a half commute each way. And so what we're getting is this crazy time and in transportation inequality, which is increasing over time. Yes, like there are several ways this might be bypassed. For example, uh, self-driving cars, if developed, uh, you know, ironically, and maybe this is unwelcome news, I expect they would make commutes longer because commutes would become more tolerable. This means more people would choose to, uh, again, live in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. So I think the suburbs currently are, you know, they're economically failing over time. And the smaller towns, I think, are economically failing over time. And city living, moving to density, even if it means moving to like a much smaller apartment, is becoming preferable again. Uh, the self-driving car would reverse this. Mm -hmm. With regard to transportation, other approaches might be uh, making construction of public transit radically cheaper. This is one of the interesting promises of the Boring Company. It's that, you know, this is Elon Musk's Boring Company, that they can make uh, basically construction of underground tunnels radically cheaper. 
With this, it might be possible to have mass underground transit in cities with densities that have so far been too low to sustain it. Mm. One of the lovely things here in New York compared to San Francisco is that there is, you know, a metro station, a subway station on every block. It's the biggest subway system in the world. There are more subway stops in the New York subway system than any other subway system in the world. And I think that New York is either the top or close to the top in terms of total miles of track in the city. Plus, it's a 24-hour subway system, which most cities don't have. There's some lines that don't run 24 hours, but New York is a total outlier in that regard. So with these two factors, any technological innovation that makes digging tunnels notably cheaper, say by a factor of 10, mm -hmm. would be a technology and an innovation that might allow a city with a million or two million residents to compete with New York in terms of, you know, the number of under uh, the number of underground uh, rail connections. Mm -hmm. Secondly, 24 hour connections become much more viable if it's possible to automate the driving and transportation of these machines. Mm -hmm. If the uh, rail cart is fully automated, if the security on the rail cart is fully automated, perhaps with facial recognition technology, it is not that expensive to run the cart 24 seven, even if it's mostly empty at night. The sheer fact of the convenience would change people's behavior over time, where at first there's no demand to you know, go on the BART say, at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. in the morning because there's no reason to because all the stores are closed. Well, eventually some things will start being open at 3 a.m. or 4 a.m. because they'll have more customers that know they can return home at 5 a.m., 6 a.m., whatever time they wish. It also makes uh, night shifts much easier, which allows several businesses to operate night shifts where previously it wouldn't be economical since the people have to drive in. So it looks like what's going to happen in the West is what we're going to do is trade privacy for convenience and everyone we've has, done it over and over again right and so we've seen this in terms of advertising and facebook and stuff but i just to try it and i'm not one of those ultra privacy people at all so just to try it i signed up for clear the other day oh interesting and so i was at the airport and this guy comes up to me and he goes, hey, do you want to sign up? And my friend had recommended it, said it was a cool experience. So I go up to sign up for Clear and I basically walk through this portal and step into Tomorrowland. It was a trip to the future. So I put my fingerprints on the scanner. I put my thumbprints on the scanner. They did this retina thing and it was really cool. And now I get to skip lines at sports stadiums and the airport. But I lost so much privacy doing this. And part of me regrets doing this as, as cool of an experience as it was. I mean, the interesting question is how much did you lose, right? Because a lot of systems that are at first voluntary, post mass adoption, on the argument of security become mandatory. Mm -hmm. So if only you've lost 10 years of fingerprint privacy, well, perhaps that's not so bad. Maybe everyone else is going to just have to have their fingerprints on their national ID card. There are, in fact, countries that have uh, opted for really extensive biometric passports. Those passports arguably already have the information. It's already, already traded between security services. Uh, a lot of people might use their fingerprint to lock their phones. I think both iPhones and Androids now have this option where you can access your passwords you know, by uh, just scanning your thumb. That information is traded around. It is information that is sold and bought. So it's not just that everything stays in this government box. It's already there in the commercial box. And it might not be worth it for some inconveniences to sa sacrifice privacy. But as long as there is something you hate more than giving your thumbprint to that company, mm -hmm. all companies might as well have it. Mm -hmm. They will trade it around. Should we be more concerned that the government is too competent, meaning that they know too much about us and we're moving to a surveillance state? Or should we be more concerned that the government is not competent enough and a weak government is, means that we could be exploited by a foreign power 
And because they're weak, they actually have to be over invasive because they can't be deliberate about what information they gather and what information stays private. Right. Um, we've had we've talked long enough that you probably can guess my answer. My answer here is that yes, I think competent government is always good. I think, however, that if we could get competent, effective government without mass surveillance, this is far preferable to one that's technologically enabled. I think we see here a substitution of the failing social technologies that might have once allowed for you know fast, responsive, secure government that still allowed and preserved civil liberties. Mm -hmm. And now we're taking the second best, which is a responsive government that uses mass surveillance to be responsive, you know, algorithms rather than civics. And this is a downgrade in quality. Ideally, we'd have something like a civic revival. But if we can't have it, I think it's better than nothing. To uh, just call back to an example you gave uh, about Clear, you know, those airport lines it didn't exist to nearly the extent before 9-11. So the fun question is, well, did you go to the future or did you go to the past? Mm -hmm. In 1970, you could board a plane, sometimes without showing ID, you just rush right on it. And of course, planes got hijacked, but in a strange way, Americans in the 1970s were comfortable with planes being hijacked. The assumption is they're hijacked for ransom, not for terrorism. Well, that speaks at something very deep, which is, the American obsession with safety. And this is a very tricky thing to talk about. So I hope that you'll give me the slack that I would like to have, because I'm going to sort of venture into some tricky waters here. But what we had historically was we wanted to build things fast and efficiently, and often we did so at the expense of human lives. And what we've done now is we are obsessed with safety. No deaths, no injuries. But I wonder if that's contributing to some of the stagnation that we're seeing in the physical environment, this over-obsession with safety. And it's hard to figure out what the right medium is here, or what, what the right middle ground is here, because on one hand, Maybe that we can build things fast and have a couple deaths or build things extremely slowly and not have any deaths. The question is, are those deaths then unseen and showing up in other parts of the economy because we're actually not building fast enough and getting some of the progress and productivity that we need in order for people to be safe? Well, you know, we should ask ourselves whether three deaths during the construction of a high-rise skyscraper perhaps are worth the 10 lives or so saved from people who don't die in the opioid crisis, who get to move into the city where they would have more economic opportunity, perhaps more meaning, perhaps more civic pride as well. Uh, this question of where do these deaths show up is very important. Now, it's very easy to say propose that economic growth is extremely important because we need to lift the third world out of poverty. It's very easy to make that comparison, but I think we're underestimating the quiet lives of despair that exist even in our own first world society. Uh, ultimately, the fact that we have what seems to be a mental health uh, public health crisis, right? In fact, we have skyrocketing um, diagnosed cases of depression and all sorts of other personality disorders and problems suggests that we actually have a bunch more misery to alleviate, right? And this might be, again, a question of uh, community, opportunity, social participation. This se sounds and seems like stuff that's not related, but I can guarantee you, you know, Every time I pass through Silma in San Francisco, my mental health gets a little bit worse. I either have to disconnect myself from, you know, the poor homeless people in the street, or I have to protect myself from people who, you know, unfortunately don't seem to be very well. Uh, and this, this is not good for you. This is not good for human beings. Their natural state is somewhat empathic. Uh, that normal urban living requires us to overlook, frankly, aesthetically unpleasing, in, displeasing environments, mm -hmm. logistical cas hassles such as commute times, and the sight of other people less fortunate, and the tragedies their lives represent. Like, I think that contributes. I think that causes us to feel alienated from society. Arguably, this is why the controversial film, uh, I think it's called uh, Joker, has proved to be the you know best-selling 
R-rated movie of all time, right? Easily beating Deadpool, which was the previous contender. It's capturing a moment. The moment is this mass disillusionment with some of the negative sides of our society, sides that could be alleviated through the kind of rapid technical progress and growth that we experienced in the 50s and 60s. The 50s and 60s aren't really the era of social conservatism. They're the era of progress, of belief in technology, of belief in tall, shiny buildings and fast planes, perhaps fast planes that fly all the way to other planets and so on. So you're, you're hitting at something really interesting here. So there's two narratives on the death of despair. One, and this is the one that I normally hear, which is, this might be the price of progress where we're so focused on gdp growth that we're forgetting about hearts and souls and we're only focused on making money and when we do that we lose community that is the narrative that i've heard play out over and over you're actually saying something very different yes. you're saying we are not progressing fast enough and what's happened is we have gotten to a place where we're not progressing, we're actually might even be seeing less capitalism now, more people doing backroom deals and more maybe monopoly power, which is, I don't want to impose too much here, but we're not progressing fast. And as a result, we're now seeing these deaths of despair. I think a lot of the deaths of despair or the lives not worth living are this loss of a result of this loss of faith in kind of the societal plan. Mm. The implicit plan, the implicit shared vision of the future in the 1960s was quite glorious, it was quite wonderful. It's something that people could aspire to, wanted to aspire to, wanted to live for. Um, you know, your private life might be worse, but you kind of feel the world is doing better and better. Every year, the world feels it's doing better, and your personal troubles seem less important inside of that. I do think, especially after a certain basic level of prosperity, our perception of how well the world is doing and the reality underneath that perception of how well the world is doing becomes a major psychological force. I think further that there's usually a false dichotomy between community and progress. I think progress properly understood would, as I say, reinvent the community for urban life or reinvent the community for the era of Instagram or the era of video. Arguably, that was already happening. We talked earlier about the communities of knowledge that formed on YouTube around the skill practice of different trades and different expertise. This false dichotomy is problematic. And I also think that even if we were to accept the dichotomy between, say, progress and community, the reality is there's less material progress right now for the typical Westerner and American than ever before. And we were more hopeful when there was more material progress, and we felt more in touch with our neighbors, and we felt more in touch with our friends, our families, and so on. I don't think it's ever possible to truly go back. We can't roll back the wheel of material or social technology. You know, things might decline or collapse, but that's nothing to look forward to. Um, you know, I've studied a bunch of those societies. The immediate aftermath is never an improvement. The only way is through. A different example might be China today, I think people don't realize, unless they visit Chinese cities, of how hopeful the average person, the average citizen of the People's Republic of China is. They feel happier and more optimistic than 40 years ago or 20 years ago. The material progress came hand in hand with this. Also, public life is changing in the cities of China. People have become less rude. People take better care of the streets. The streets seem clean. The streets seem beautiful. People have now more and more trust in their fellow citizen. Are we perhaps seeing in San Francisco today, and you know, dare I say it, New York, a regression to a society with a lower level of trust? Perhaps the lower level of trust is reflecting this loss of faith in fellow man and society, a loss of faith that is not irrationally driven by scaremongering news, but just out of a, an accurate observation that things aren't moving. I want to return to the lack of trust point, but I just want to 
double down on one thing. What accounts for the discrepancy between intellectuals like Hans Rosling and Steven Pinker, who say that the world is getting so much better, and the cultural milieu, which is dystopian movies, and the world is going to get so much worse. We have 12 years to live before climate change destroys the world. I think the disconnect is driven partially because people's ability to make sense of uh, the world has decreased. The information economy has been wonderful for illuminating our own social lives to ourselves. It has been less wonderful for understanding the world accurately. I also have to say that uh, I think the intellectuals are also wrong to a significant extent. There's a beautiful graph in uh, one of Pinker's books. It's a graph of uh, the drop in global poverty. It looks amazing. It's presented together with the story of progress, of the alleviation of poverty in the poorest parts of the world. Yet, if you control for China, that graph looks kind of flat. So instead of the story of automatic progress, it is the story of a particular place and time that skyrocketed through an industrialization. So, you know, Pinker, your graphs are made in China. So, of course, people in the West don't feel hopeful. And also, arguably, people in many other countries don't feel hopeful. There are many parts of the world that are seeing none of this Pinkerian progress. Of course, there are other intellectual critiques where you might say that, you know, this Prankarian progress comes at the price of fragility. This fragility is, I think, intellectually perceived by people, which might be feeding the uh, climate apocalypse fears, right? I sort of, I think that if our institutions are adaptive, agile, if we're a civilization constantly replenished by new great founders, we will be able to adapt to the climate and eventually also find solutions, possibly one day terraforming the climate back to what it was, similar to how some people dream of uh, terraforming Mars. You know, anything you can do on Mars, you can do in Antarctica, except it's easier and cheaper. So what do you make of, say, the argument that certainly the kinetic energy of nuclear weapons, we haven't exploded all that, but our potential to destroy the entire planet, the potential energy is, say, increasing at half a percent per year. What do you make of that argument? I'm not certain our ability and our potential to destroy the world are incre is increasing. I think for the most part, when we reach the mad equilibrium of the massive nuclear arsenals between the United States and Russia, the risk is about the same today as it was in the like early 1970s. The nuclear weapons risk is so much bigger than, say, nanotech, biowarfare, as something that could really wipe our civilization out, that the other ones are rounding errors. Mm -hmm. Of all man-made risks, nuclear warfare is the greatest. Perhaps this is something to tie back to the nuclear, uh, perhaps this is something to tie back to the climate apocalypse point. Well, you know, those growing up in the 60s also expected to die in 20 years, except they expected to die in nuclear fire. We forget that the first Mad Max movie, then the second one, were about nuclear war. If you watch Mad Max 4, it seems to be a movie about climate change or environmentalism. So perhaps we've not actually become more apocalyptic, just our vision of annihilation changed from one of... Uh, technological supremacy, so the detonation of uh, thousands of precision-delivered nuclear devices, you know, fueled by this military-industrial complex of hyper-competent people working very hard to doom us all, to, oh man, we will actually fail to coordinate to prevent climate change. In a way, a story of institutional helplessness, again, empowered by technology and fossil fuels and so on, but in, in a far less flashy way. You know, the idea that humans go extinct in a nuclear war, it's almost optimistic, you know, if perversely so. The idea that they, you know, die due to climate change that they themselves caused but failed to coordinate over, well, you know, that's, that's less human. That's human incompetence, right? That's human incompetence. That's not our, uh, our demons damning us. That's like our acrasia damning us. Mm -hmm. You know, you were talking earlier about trust, and I want to return to this. I had breakfast last week with a big name Indian entrepreneur and one thing that I couldn't believe about everything he said was it came back to trust and what he was just trying to say is 
As somebody who's living in the West, David, you have no idea what it's like to live in an environment with low social trust. Something as simple as interest rates being as low as they are in the West comes back to trust. And the fact that all of you are able to, at least in your life, David, the fact that you are able to assume that when you have an interaction with somebody, they're not going to screw you over. You do not know how lucky you are about that. He said, where I am in my experience growing up in India, we don't have this and it makes progress and any kind of accomplishment so much more difficult. I think the this is very important difference between societies, but it's also something that we can't really take for granted. It's something that has varied historically, you know, over and over again, where societies have gone into cycles towards higher trust, but have also moved towards lower trust. I think that today China is a society that is moving towards a higher trust equilibrium. The West, though, seems to be suffering a crisis of lower trust, not just in its institutions, but in other people. In a way, these are partially self-fulfilling prophecies, but it's not just a prophetic sort of story where if we all merely trust each other, then we're all going to be capable of carrying out these implicit minor promises, you know, everything from a, from a transaction to a contract kept. Uh, it also rests on the capability to carry them out. There are real and fundamental social technologies that transformed, say, the unwieldy clannish society of 10th century Scotland into the relatively peaceable or even intellectually oriented engineering society of the 18th and 19th century with the Scottish Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution to perhaps the relatively peaceful, quiet, somewhat green in orientation Scotland of today. These transformations are larger than almost any variation we might see between contemporary existing cultures. In a very real way, perhaps, you know, humanity's cursed with the memory, the collective memory of a goldfish mm -hmm. for people that have moving from low trust societies to high trust societies. They see how much less friction there is to move, say, in a dense urban environment. One of the limitations on an urban environment is how how trustworthy your fellow citizens are, the fellow residents of that city. And for someone who sees this immediate contrast, say, by immigrating to the United States, that's very visceral. You understand what changed. But if it's been a certain way, like a high trust equilibrium for so many generations, mm -hmm. you might not understand how all of these small trade-offs eventually would amount to a much worse place. The slow, you know, the slow decline is less visible than the rapid progress of switching countries. Yeah, you were talking about great founder theory earlier, which I still think is my favorite idea of yours. And if I look at, so I'm in my 20s, if I look at what my friends have aspired to, very few have aspired to actually building things. And I enjoy spending time with scientists and engineers and entrepreneurs because they're actually making things. They're spending their time building. And one thing that seems very problematic, there's two things. The first one is how many of our most talented people now go into paper shuffling for a career where they move around administrative documents, they work in management consulting, they're moving around this idea and that idea. And then how many very successful entrepreneurs become investors who then just deploy capital, but they don't actually build anything themselves. Overstated, understated, what are your thoughts here? I think the creation of institutions is always undervalued compared to participating in institutions that seem to work well. Participating in institutions that are actually functional is of course very productive and, and should be encouraged, but the illusion of functionality can persist for far longer than the substance of it. The creation of new institutions is the same act as reforming existing ones. Mm -hmm. If you don't know how to build something new, you won't really know how to fix this big social machine that you never put together in the first place. There is no manual written on how the Fed should work. Mm -hmm. Even for the US government, if you were to say, be very charitable and call the Constitution a manual, let's just say its documentation is lacking, right? And there are 
there are companies all over society that have had brilliant R&D departments, brilliant marketing departments, brilliant logistics departments. They've gone to waste as soon as the old manager or the old engineer retired. Mm -hmm. And no one within the company has the affordance to rebuild the same thing in-house, mm -hmm. which means that there's, in fact, a loss of functionality. And for a while, the cost can be passed on to, you know, the consumer, or we can rely on other functional institutions. You know, my company doesn't need good logistics because Amazon handles logistics for me. Well, what if Amazon gets bad at logistics one day with so many organizations depending on it? I'm reminded of PG&E in California and it's rolling blackouts. What's the economic cost there? How many servers and websites had to go offline? How many individuals' lives were disrupted? We were all relying on the power grid just being there and being reliable. We probably would have never invested in a startup in a city where the power grid isn't reliable, would we, had we expected it to be there? As soon as those sort of things become the new normal and there's no affordance to, say, start a new power company or at least sell cheap batteries or cheap generators to have people compensate for it, you know, without any hitch in supply, um, these, uh, these functions won't come back. I want to double down on the question, which is, should we, do we have a narrative problem where our youngest people aren't builders? I think the narrative problem exists, but it has to be made much more visceral. The idea should be that you should aspire, say, not to just be a YouTube star, but be a media operation. Perhaps at first a one-man media operation, one-person media operation, but eventually you should aspire to hire others to assist you. Perhaps you need a professional video editor. Perhaps you need someone to book your events. Perhaps you need someone to help you publish a book. These are all important steps towards building your private brand to the point where you are an institution. You know, maybe one day there'll be Perel Industries. That would be interesting. I would want to see what their product is. <sighs> don't hold your breath, my friend. Don't hold your breath. Well, it just, I just don't understand what's happening here because it seems like when I look at what's happening with a bunch of young people, I see this tragic cycle where they get into student debt and as a result, rather than having your 20s, which is your time of peak creativity and peak freedom, like I was at dinner last week and the woman I was having dinner with was saying, oh, you know, life is a marathon. It isn't about accomplishing something soon. It's about accomplishing something over the course of your life. And I think it's a great idea, but I fundamentally think that your 20s are the time to go get after it because you don't have kids and you don't have a wife or a husband. And as a result, this is the time to get after it. I think the uh, data is on your side there. We discussed earlier, and you know, this has often been brought up, uh, that a fallout in earning potential in your 20s is reflected even in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. If, for example, you are unfortunate enough to be ill in your early 20s, comparing cohorts, it's really clear that that early illness took out a bunch of your earning potential when you were 50, even if you recovered from the illness. There is such a thing as momentum, momentum in building networks, momentum in building skills, the sort of energy where you can wake up at 7 a.m. in the morning, work all day, go home at 7 p.m. and still have time to attend a cool party where you meet useful people. Mm -hmm. That does not last, right? Human biology is what it is. Um, I do think that we have made a terrible mistake where we have locked most of society into credentialing races. And these credentialing races have, and I'm not exaggerating, put people uh, into prisons. It's not a sociologically controversial observation to point out how schools, prisons, and hospitals have very common modes of operation. Uh, you are stuck in an ivy, you know, perhaps, perhaps it's an alabaster tower, right, this, this ivory tower, uh, but it's at best a golden cage. And it's a golden cage where after you're out of the cage, after you finally get the job, uh, they put you the bill for the cost of the gold, mm -hmm. right? And then you have to work your way out of it. Uh, perhaps it would be better to just give them a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars to blow instead. 
And, you know, this was experimented with with various things like uh, the Teal Fellowship and so on. So in terms of great founders, how do you see the distribution on that changing? So one thing I've noticed is increasingly the most interesting people who reach out to me, and I have no idea why, are girls from like 18 to 24 who are feel so empowered by the internet and they are convinced that they are going to be the next Elon Musk's and Steve Jobs, and they will tell it to you. It is absolutely awesome. And what I see happening there is us giving women freedom and ability to go pursue what they want to pursue, and in that way, expanding the number of great founders in the world, which I think is great. It's always an interesting question as to how these trends, you know, what brings these trends about and to what extent they they materialize or don't. Um, I think that the jury remains out on how many more great founders we're going to see. I am pessimistic in general for, you know, men and women. I think currently we often lack these very basic social skills. But I've seen some of the trend you've described. And where I to give it a reason is I think that social media is in fact friendly to these skill sets that can be developed that don't require us this this sort of imposing physical presence that men are very comfortable with yeah. so it's not even that i think our societal ideals changed at first i think sort of the like you know the economics of getting your message out there and building a social network changed shifted because of digital technology, shifted in the direction of good photography. You know, I remember when I was growing up, you know, a lot of my friends had this, like, perhaps mildly sexist observation that girls are so silly, they always buy the best phone with the best camera and spend so much time editing pictures. We were just talking how valuable a skill it is to edit pictures well. They developed, in fact, an important skill set that perhaps the boys were incorrectly neglecting. So this shift in how the media environment works, the social media environment, might be stronger, it might be then changing the culture downstream, rather than it being a cultural change reflected in the, in the sort of like economic activity. Switching gears a bit, what do you see happening with the news and the media? I mean, it just seems like a lot of the mainstream publications that we have traditionally depended on are going absolutely insane, going psycho. And it's very hard for us to make sense of what's happening in the world and to find reliable data. My goodness, to find reliable data on climate change, it is so hard. And it's not until I'm with a climate scientist and having drinks with that climate scientist that I can feel like I'm getting a modicum of truth, let alone to read the front page of some major publication in the morning. Yes. I mean, the question is, why should anyone tell you the truth, right? And this perhaps goes back to the idea of a high trust society. In a high trust society, people would perhaps feel, especially very motivated people, people who disproportionately shape organizations might feel a strong moral obligation towards being truthful and not designing intentionally misleading media strategies, even if they're very successful, either as political propaganda or as marketing. Uh, I think we've, we're far past that point. And as I said, you know, you can't go back, you have to go through. Uh, I suspect that there is a comeback right now of private for pay mailing lists hmm. where people identify experts much in the way you might in a community of practice in say, you know, the woodworkers of YouTube or the car repair uh, experts of YouTube, mm -hmm. they might figure out who among them has the best reputation. Uh, there exists this kind of uh, basically private punditry in finance. It exists in tech. A lot of the people being build a strong personal brand. They don't control the platform. They don't control a big institution. They're not beholden to a big institution. So you know they get to tell the truth to their audience. Mm -hmm. They also acquire more and more expert recognition in their field. Say, being a, physicist, being a physicist with an actually good physics blog that occasionally cites your papers might be a better way to get others to cite your paper mm -hmm. than investing an extra bit of uh, energy into polishing the academic paper itself. The academic paper won't stand out. 
the uh, blog posts might. So this actually then redoubles back into your ability to participate in the normal economy. So I would say that the solution is in people who have this very strong, verified reputation of expertise and truthfulness in a community of enthusiasts. That's where I would place the hope for a better informed future. So if I were to give a recommendation right now is decide what are the four most important things you want to understand about the world, the four areas that you absolutely must follow, and then dig, dig on the internet and find some names, some actual human names, not the New York Times, right? And not whatever Facebook news, you know, accountability agency exists. Figure out who is the person you trust. If need be, learn how to evaluate that expert. You put that investment in, it's probably something like, I don't know, 20 hours of research. You can rely on that person probably for years or decades to come as long as they're active in writing those regular missives. This is exactly right, but it is not a scalable solution and it won't work <laughs> for society at large at all. But this, what you're talking about right now, is one of the biggest arbitrages in the world because in a world with limitless information, taste becomes a comparative advantage. And it seems that what you're saying is absolutely terrible, terrible for the median person. The median person, it might even be getting stupider as a result of if you're just consuming this average information. Yes. But when I meet intelligent people and they talk about other intelligent people who are young, they say young people now are the smartest class of – smart young people now are the smartest class of smart young people ever. So what you might have is the middle of the curve might be shifting left, whereas on the right side of the curve, that's shifting up. And those people who are outliers here who are doing what you're talking about – they might be getting a lot more intelligent as a result of the internet. But what's a tragedy to me, and this is why I will not accept the current state of the media, is when I go back and I read Engelbart and Licklider and the early visionaries of the computer revolution, the idea of tools for thought was that computers were going to make us smarter and we're not even close to the potential of what computers can do for us. Yes. I mean, I think the solution for the average person will probably come out of the talent of those uh, young, smartest people ever. If only they turned their attention towards uh, building institutions as such. If you imagine someone that has been reputably writing on a topic to a small audience for 10 years, it really should not be difficult for them to publish a book. That book should actually be picked up by algorithms, either on Amazon or elsewhere, mm -hmm. as something that is a reliable, good source of information, something that's been you know, endorsed by an audience, perhaps an audience that is identified as experts. Mm -hmm. There are some hopes, therefore, for scaling this stuff, right? Like a lot of people can listen to a podcast way more than will read a mailing list. A lot of people might end up ordering a book. Some of them might even read it. Mm -hmm and so on and so on, ultimately, I'm still shocked. Like, for example, there's a giant opportunity to completely transform the media ecosystem that requires an awareness of when physical space does matter and when it does not. Mm. I think one of the unusual ideas we have today is that the internet is separated by subculture rather than geography. Yet everyone understands that San Francisco Twitter, or at least West Coast Twitter, versus East Coast Twitter, are like separated. They're different ecosystems. Mm -hmm. There's also the observation that, you know, San Francisco uses Twitter and LA uses Instagram. Mm. But we don't yet think about how the idea that the internet has made space irrelevant has been slightly exaggerated. Space is relevant. So now that I set up this basic insight, where am I going? What I'm going to point out is that the largest class of writers in the United States today exists in Silicon Valley. They just write code. And more controversially, most of the coders employed at the big tech companies such as Facebook, Google, Twitter, they're underemployed. They read a lot of Twitter. They read a lot of blogs. So why has no one gone around and fundraised 
with all of those thousands of Google engineers and Facebook engineers and Twitter engineers and said, how would you like to show up to a nice party? A nice party held by a new magazine based in San Francisco speaking to you and about your issues. They would want to be part of that physical social club because they're physically concentrated there and they want to consume the written content and they want to brag to their friends about how they're supporting this written content. And there's already the, the seeds of this, and I predict this will happen. The seeds of this are in what I call the Californian standard blogging style. Mm. There's a style of writing that is very Californian in character. Of course, it originates San Francisco, Bay Area, but people write in it in New York as well. The hallmarks are highly intelligent, precise, simple writing that, however, isn't as flowery or as illusion-filled or as well-informed in terms of the history of the humanities that, say, writing might be in The New Yorker. Mm -hmm. The literary scene in New York is a product of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. Is there going to be a literary scene of San Francisco in the 2020s, 2030s, and 2040s? You know, you could argue that San Francisco today is as gritty as New York ever was, mm -hmm. right? And New York seems the safe, predictable, orderly, and clean city. Uh, so, you know, whatever your theory of creation is, I think there's massive opportunities to create an entirely new literary scene fueled by this in-person socializing. So, I, that's a really interesting point about the differences between the New York literary scene that we find in the New Yorker and more mainstream institutions, and then the San Francisco blogosphere, which now that I think about it, just my writing school, Rite of Passage, is really inspired by that San Francisco blogosphere. I'd never made that connection. My question is that one of the benefits of doing that kind of writing online is you can create your own credentials in that it is getting prohibitively expensive to go to college for undergrads, for graduate students and people who do write online are able to create opportunities for themselves. When in society, if you trace credentialism with your understanding of history, I'm curious to hear what has studying all that history, how has that informed your take on credentialism? Are we doomed to this world of institutions just certifying that you're good or you're not good to corporations outsourcing a lot of hiring to Ivy League institutions and actually saving money by just saying, well, if you have an Ivy League diploma, we know that you're at least going to be an above average worker. What do you see happening here? I think that the institutions in question, the ones that are currently dominating credentialing and so on, uh, they in fact are, they are on the way out. The reason is they don't really understand the new economy. They don't really understand uh, how they would even recognize an autodidact. I was recently talking to a very good friend. Um, she's a pianist, and she told me that uh, some of the talent scouts she was talking to from the more established institutions were like, "You're an amazing, you're an amazing pianist, but you you play the piano in." this completely different way from what we've seen anyone else play. I, you know, I just can't take the risk of betting on you. Isn't that an interesting contradiction? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, there were institutions that were happy to bet on her, and those institutions won. And those institutions will continue to win. So the most flexible of the old crop of institutions, the ones that will recognize these world-class, talented, self-taught people, or people who have sought out other world-class experts and gotten an informal but real education rather than a formal but fake education, uh, that talent will win. So it's only a question of which institutions will uh, end up harnessing this. And perhaps there'll be completely new ones built. Why couldn't there be a San Francisco Times that's more important than the New York Times? Why couldn't there be an online university that actually filters its talent pool better? Or why couldn't running a startup have been a credential that is as good as having done a BA? The question is, what can we use as proxies for credentials? Because we need 
ways to we, we we can't get all the data on people so per, we personal endorsements would be a big deal okay i think personal endorsements by the people who are publicly and universally recognized as experts in a field should carry way more weight hmm. how would you do that that's a really interesting idea i think for starters i would open a simple project where anyone that is considered a world-class expert in a domain should make an open call I'm going to create a fellowship. It's going to be named after me. The other name, uh, you know, it's going to be a two-part fellowship, comes from a wealthy sponsor. And I'm going to give 10 people a monetary grant to work in my field because I personally believe and endorse that this young person is exceptional in that domain. Can you imagine like a thousand such grants? Mm -hmm. That personal endorsement, you better believe it, would be very strong. Right, And it would be something that even bureaucracies would have to start recognizing eventually. So this kind of personal endorsement or these sort of programs that are perhaps similar to going through Y Combinator, mm -hmm. why couldn't there be something Y Combinator-like for other parts of the economy? Where if you make a class, that is a credential in itself. Also, there are fun ways to hack this. If you're a Stanford dropout, arguably you get most of the benefits of Stanford. You already passed, like entrance exam. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe at one point uh, Stanford's just going to certify. You know, going to start printing out. Uh, you would have been accepted to Stanford had you attended degrees. That would be so funny. Uh, I don't think they will, but some equivalent of that. Well, that's quite interesting. Yeah, I mean, we were really built up around this idea of of college. There was an article in the Atlantic, and it was by George Packer and he was talking about the culture of New York schools and there was some quote in here that was like well I need to do well in middle school because if I don't do well in middle school I won't get into a good high school and if I don't do well in high school I won't get into a good college and if I don't get into a good college I'm gonna fail at life that's that's such a heartbreaking quote, such isn't it? Such a heartbreaking quote. I read this and my jaw just hit the floor. And we are, as a society, so around college that I even talked to some – I'm close to a family that lives on the Upper East Side and – they have two girls who are in high school. And so I, I, I just love hanging out with them. They're awesome. And I talk to them about all the pressure that people on the Upper East Side kids feel to get into these good colleges. And they feel more pressure than I ever feel in running a business, than I ever feel in any of the things that I do. I think that being a high schooler right now is the time in life, unless you're the CEO of a massive Fortune 500 company, like the peak of pressure that we face right now. I mean, it's, it's rather incredible, right, that we've sort of set up the game of college admissions to be so easily gameable by a choreographed high school life. This should not be the case. This is clearly uh, a system on its way to failure. This is a system where the answers to the test have long since become public knowledge, and everyone's trying really, really hard to fake the known answer to the test. And this effort gets in the way of actually mastering what the test was supposed to search for. It was supposed to search for several things. Uh, there was knowledge, but there was also social skill. And there was also the ability to do teamwork and the ability to work with institutions. If you think about it, all of that can be demonstrated. Anyone who has lived as a minor public figure of any kind has had their life under scrutiny, possibly for years. Well, if you can do that, then you can probably get along with people in a company and you're probably not a PR risk for the company. And the demonstration of knowledge can also be done in other ways. I think that the credentialing testing aspect and the social behavior aspect, here there is a, an uncomfortable solution that I'm going to propose. I'm going to propose, well, all of that data that's collected on your phone, all of those fingerprints, all of that metadata, all of your browsing habits. If we were to deploy a learning model to try to find whether you would make a good white collar employee or not, I bet we could do it. I bet maybe, maybe we should embrace big data's ability to find out who is a potentially good employee and good company fit and who is not.
Now, this perhaps sounds even more unfair or outrageous than college, but I note it's not going to cost you hundreds of thousands of dollars, nor is it going to cost you years of your life. It will only cost you to allow to use the uh, data that's already out there on you for the purposes of evaluating you as an employee. Here, I actually think that the privacy advocates will get it wrong. I think they'll advocate against this kind of worker evaluation, but really they should be advocating for it. Well, at the same time, that though ramps things up into high gear in terms of what you would do for 18 years on your phone and how every second matters. That would just be terrifying. I mean, would it be? Or would it just be too difficult to optimize 10,000 variables? Well, this the question here is would having this kind of surveillance just make us much more intelligent and more capable people. And I would argue that the answer is yes, even though I have such a philosophical rage against that idea. I, I can understand the philosophical rage. I share it to a significant degree. But then, you know, the question is, what's the better option? What's the worse option? I think it also would eventually have flaws. I think there would be a productive period of about 20 to 30 years where people had not yet learned to game this well. We might as well call it a social score system, right. you know, social credit score system. Uh, they eventually would learn how to game it. And eventually uh, organizational pressures would build that would cause people to want to fudge the data or fudge the interpretation of the data or disallow certain algorithms or not. So the measurement would become worse. I fear that when it comes to evaluating talent at scale, it's always going to be a case of, well, the old paradigm is terrible. Let's overthrow it with a new paradigm. Oh, wait, we've all gamed the new paradigm. It's now becoming an end to itself. It's now a terrible paradigm. Uh, Chinese history is a very interesting analog here, where the dynastic cycle always had, whenever a new dynasty came in, they would recreate the civil service exam, set it out completely new, because the old civil service exam had become corrupt over the many decades and centuries of people trying to, competing to, entering the administrative class. Mm. So one of the basic tasks of each new cycle of Chinese civilization, through all the dynasties, had been resetting the civil service and the civil service exam. The civil service exam arguably being the closest analog to the white collar college degree of today. Perhaps we're always going to be just outrunning this sort of wave of competitive pressure that's aimed at the finger, not the moon. This seems like a, I, I, I love that idea, finger, not the moon. This seems like a societal issue that we're repeatedly going to face where, look at Facebook. Facebook, in order to game the engagement data, in my opinion, has made the product much worse. And it seems like the truth of what's happening in terms of watching people not use the product nearly as much is a lagging, is a leading indicator in terms of what's going to happen to the company. With that said, Facebook has done an incredible job of creating a product that can serve 2 billion people. I mean, my goodness, what a product visionary Mark Zuckerberg is and what an achievement that is. We've never had a product that has been used by so many people. But I have seen time and again the p times where Facebook's obsession with engagement has hurt the product. And this is one of the big worries when we build. It's like Goodhart's Law. Any metric that becomes a measure ceases to become a good measure at all. We need ways of working around this and ways of thinking about this if we're going to be using algorithms and machine learning and artificial intelligence that automatically optimizes for something. I think that's a, that's a worry that we've always had, right? Like you had an automated evaluation system that existed long before we gathered information uh, and processed through algorithms. Every bureaucracy is a machine implemented with human parts, right? The bureaucracies of the past struggle to make the world legible, being, you know, human-built machines for interpreting the world, 
where an individual would come and knock on your door and ask how many people are in your house. Mm -hmm. Well, today we probably, if we wanted to do a census using 2019 technology, we would just knock on the server room door at Google and ask them how many people are living in this house. Mm -hmm. This again feels a little bit uncomfortable to people, but it's merely a technological change, right? And this sort of um, this sort of technological change is one that will eventually also be overcome. I would not be surprised if in the future they develop very smart ways to uh, protect our privacy. Perhaps there will be massive demand for privacy. Perhaps the people that achieve privacy will have the most freedom of thought. And perhaps the values of the people who have achieved privacy, despite the technological barriers to it, will come to dominate since they'll be the most talented individuals in society. I think we're already seeing elements of this where unusual people who have been thinking on their own from seemingly the fringes reach large audiences on the internet very rapidly. Mm -hmm. The final step that is missing here is the step from an internet audience to an institution that is legitimized by the legacy organizations. Mm -hmm. The best way to transform society isn't to sell out, it's to have the establishment sell out to you. Wow. So I want to, it reminds me of this idea that the real benefit of being a contrarian is having a contrarian idea and making the world agree with you exactly. and then monetizing the arbitrage between the way the world used to think and then the way the world now thinks. That is what true contrarianism is and that's exactly what you're getting at. I want to close this circle where it began. We started with YouTube, we'll end with YouTube and I want to talk about language. One of your big theses is that basically since the Cold War, we've seen smaller and smaller countries. We've seen the balkanization of the world. Do you think that there are going to be similar shifts with language? Are we going to end up with a kind of Tower of Babel? There's languages or one of the original network effects where there's maybe one or two languages that everybody speaks. Or do you think that language will be preserved? I think that, uh, in general, recording technology pushes towards the preservation of language, though anyone that's listened to a recording from the 1940s agrees that the mid-Atlantic accent just sounds kind of weird. So language can shift despite recordings. Uh, I think there are a number of ways in which language will change. It's already been heavily influenced by texting, so phrases that originally start as acronyms make their way into spoken, spoken words, spoken language. Uh, I think that what will happen is there will be a dominance of a few small number of languages, but these num languages will have a growing number of dialects. Often the cultural references that people use are more and more fragmented to their particular peculiar subculture. Mm -hmm. This is best seen with memes where some memes become very, very niche or it's sort of a, like an inside joke between like 40, 50, maybe 500 people. Yeah. No one else in the world gets it. And sometimes some of those memes become big and, you know, they're shared around by millions of people. Still, some of these communities have now persisted for decades, building up their own vocabulary. How far could that go? I think potentially it can go a very long way, uh, especially if the transience of these networks starts dropping. I think what is underestimated today is that today's 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds, 40 years from now, they'll basically still be trying to use the same internet that exists right now in 2019 or existed in 2010. They won't even realize it, but they will in fact seek out that internet. And their language, well, it might be notably different, it might be English, but what's the English of a 20-year-old in 2050 going to sound like? Would you understand it? Perhaps not. Yeah, I wonder what will – because you were talking about that San Francisco blogging culture earlier, and one thing that I like about it is it prizes clarity of writing above everything else. It does. I think this is one of the positive inheritances of uh, basically coding. If you have programmers who write, well, of course they're going to define the variable. They're going to define the word, and they're going to use the same word. They might make up a word if they don't already know it, so they won't look in a dictionary. They'll just coin a new term, and ideally, they'll try to make it catchy and memorable because they know you can't just have all your variables be X, Y, and Z. That's a way to write very, very bad code. So that 
pushed in that direction because the demonstration of intelligence was clarity and precision. It wasn't necessarily erudition or familiarity with you know, a vast vocabulary. You could make your own vocabulary. That was a better display of intelligence. So that means that it's easier to jump into it. Uh, it also at times means that it can be more fragmented. Uh, and I think that people who appreciate the blogging style still know how to read The New Yorker. They still know how to read the more erudite style. They recognize it as a sign of intelligence. But the people raised in the New Yorker style, in the East Coast style, they don't understand what is the difference between an intelligent blogger or a random person. They don't know how to say, see the signs of intelligence in clear, good writing. They're seeking for erudition. They're seeking for an East Coast Ivy League degree. And uh, I'm sorry, you know, your, 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 your map no longer works. It's slightly obsolete. And the people who can use both maps do the best. So, Boboria, thanks for coming on the podcast. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having me on here again.